Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Thank you. I am Chuck C., and I'm an alcoholic. Hi. I want to thank the committee for allowing Mr. C. and I to share this weekend with you. And I want to thank all of you people for coming. I always think it's nice if you go someplace to talk if somebody comes. (laughs) (laughs) Joe and I were talking about you people this morning, and that's wino, Joe. And it was our feeling that the spirit in this get-together has been just about the best we've been in a long time. You're a great bunch of people. The vibes have been very, very good here this weekend, and I've enjoyed it very much. I didn't sleep very well last night. I got to wondering whether I should explain Joe's talk. (laughs) (laughs) I just just go ahead and make my contribution. (laughs) And I uh, almost ran out of night before I went to sleep. I have a question to uh, answer before I get through. It seems like I talked in, uh, I believe it was Portland, some years back, and I said that uh, I discovered that I'd already turned my will and my life over to the care of God. You know? And that if I didn't run out of time, I'd talk a little about it later on. And I ran out of time. (laughs) And I suspect that's been a number of years ago, hasn't it? So I'm going to try to answer that before I get through this morning. My uh, advent into this leper colony is a little different than most. Now, I didn't say I'm different. I said my advent into the society. When I was hurting the worst, there wasn't any Alcoholics Anonymous. And after drinking for 15 years, I... uh, Decided I wasn't drinking well. I'd had a code for drinking. I'd had a code for everything in life. And the first 15 years I'd done fairly well uh, drinking according to my code. I call the first 15 years good drinking. And the only way I can call the first 15 years good drinking was to compare them with the last 10. <laughs> but I, uh, I didn't like the way I was drinking. So I had a session with me just about the time that Ebby had his first session with Bill W. It really almost coincided. And I uh, came up with the conclusion that this was a personal weakness, something I had to overcome to be rid of. And I started a 10-year battle to overcome this weakness. I worked on it very diligently, and the harder I worked, the worse it got. 
And the worse it got, the harder I worked. And the farther backwards I went, the greater was my obsession to win. I was saying to myself, five years after everybody quit listening to me, I'll beat this thing if it's the last thing I ever do. And it came that close to being the last thing I ever did. So I think that my ten years prior to coming to Alcoholics Anonymous would compare rather favorably to many who come and fight for ten years after they get here. Because when I got here, the fight was over. I'll tell you a little bit about the last time out and then hurry along. My last drunk today started the Friday before Christmas, 1945. My boss called me in that day, and I was sure that it was going to be curtains, because I knew I had it coming. But instead of shooting me, as he had every right to do, he started talking, which was a good thing, I thought. And he said to me, Charlie, I was Charlie in business. He says, you've had a lot of trouble this year. Now, he didn't mention alcohol, but he knew that I knew what he meant when he said trouble. And being a non-alcoholic, he had it analyzed. He says, I think I know the reason you've had so much trouble. I think it's because of the pressure you're under. And he says to me, I'm going to take a little pressure off of you, and maybe next year you won't have so much pressure, and you won't have so much trouble. And so again, instead of shooting me, he gave me $3,000 for a Christmas present to take the pressure off of me. Now, if you don't think he took the pressure off of me, you're nuts. There's one thing worse for an alcoholic than bad fortune, and that's good fortune. (laughs) (laughs) So I got drunk on the way home. Now, that wasn't par for the course for me, because I was a periodic for the last ten years that I drank. Periodic on purpose, because you see, I was going to beat this rap. And you can't fight a very good battle when you're down on your back. So you had to get well enough to get in the ring for the next round. And periodics don't get drunk quickly. Periodics do not taper off. They taper on. (laughs) We have a regular routine. We drink until we can't get it down and can't get it up and can't live and can't die. (laughs) And then we have to sober up. Now, in my day, there was no way to, uh, there was no way to sober up easily. The only way I ever knew to sober up was to die until I could get better. And so we would do that. And as soon as we started getting a little better, we'd go into a health kick. We drank a lot of milk. We'd eat a lot of vitamins. We'd sleep well when we could. And we would get strong enough to take a few exercises. And when we got the body pretty well in shape, we would then analyze our last drunk. And we would see where we made our mistakes. <laughs> and we decided not to do it that way anymore. Now, this was a regular routine. And after we got everything in its place, we would start sampling. And we'd sample our way right on back to bed. And not quickly. <laughs> it usually took me any place from 30 to 60 days to get off my feet after I'd take my first drink 
after a dry spell. That I always made it. I never missed on that. So, it wasn't far for the course for me to get drunk on the way home after the boss's talk with me. So that was different to start with. I remember nothing from the Friday before Christmas, 1945, until sometime after the middle of January, 1946. Mrs. C. says that all I did during that probably four weeks was to empty bottles in bed, drinking the clock around. That's all I did. And I remember nothing about it at all. And yet I came to, sometime after the middle of January, with the clearest head I've ever had in my entire lifetime. Which again seems impossible. Because I had nothing in my body but booze. I never ate when I drank. I drank when I drank. And so there was nothing in my skin but booze. And yet I came to with the clearest head I've ever known. And I saw me for the first time in my life with nothing between me and me. Everything had burned out during that four weeks period. Every excuse was gone, even including my mother-in-law. <laughs> now, there was a king-sized reason for getting drunk. <laughs> my wife's mother had only one kid, and I was married to her. And she was living with us. And she had a grandstand seat watching me crucify her only daughter. And she didn't like me very good. And I didn't like her that good. <laughs> because if she hadn't been living with us, I wouldn't have had to crucify her daughter. So it was all her fault. And she lasted five years after all the rest of my excuses had left me. She was still good. But the last time, she even burned out. Now, <clears throat> lest I forget it, you would be absolutely astounded to know that she lived with us five years after I sobered up, and this program made a new woman out of her. <laughs> I'm quite sure if she'd have come in the last year of her life and found me slapping her only daughter all over the all over the house, she would have said, Why, Elsa, what have you done? <laughs> because by then I could do no wrong at all. She uh had another little dealy for that last five years she lived with us, too. Because she would not believe that I'd gotten any help from any quarter. She would come up and put her arms around me and say, Oh, son, I always knew you had it in you. <laughs> and I'd start blushing from my shoe tops. Because I'd fought, I'd fought a, a real battle. I'd given it every resource I had. Every resource I had, I put in that last fight. And I lost. But she would not believe that I'd ever gotten any help from God or you or anybody else. Well, I came to with the clearest head I've ever known. I saw me with nothing between me and me. And I accepted the fact that I'd lost the battle of life. Now, I did not know why, because I knew nothing of alcoholism. But I knew that I'd lost the battle of life. Mrs. C., after 20 years, was divorcing me. 
And I might say quickly, without cause. <laughs> I've given her 20 of the best years of my life. <laughs> and here she was divorcing me. And I accepted that. And I knew why. And I knew she should have done it 10 years before. Our kids wouldn't even come home when I was around, if they could help it. And I knew why that was. And this same boss man had sent word to the house that if I ever stepped foot in the plant again, he was going to throw me through the window. And the window he had picked out, don't open. <laughs> I accepted the fact that morning that everything dear to me in life was gone and should be gone. And that I was not entitled to have it back. Now I'm going to say that again because that's what my last 32 years have been built on. I totally and completely accepted the fact that everything dear to me in life was gone and should be gone. And that I was not entitled to have it back. And it suddenly became very necessary for me to be sober until I died. <clears throat> Not because I wanted sobriety, because I didn't. I didn't want anything for me, because I knew it was going to die. And I didn't want to die with a record. I didn't want Mrs. C. and the kids to remember me as nothing but a tongue-chewing, babbling idiot drunk. And I, uh, I just must use whatever time I had before I died to rub out as much of the record as I could. Now, there are many in this room who have lived with people like me and who knew that we didn't love you. I suspect Mrs. C. has said to me 500 times, Chuck, if you loved us, you wouldn't do these things. And how could I tell her that it was because I loved her and the kids that I did it? You can't sell that bill of goods. So you don't say anything. But I never, I never, during my entire 25 years of drinking, reached a point where I didn't love my wife and my kids. I was a periodic, as I told you. And many times between drunks, when I was physically as dry as I am right now, I would get to thinking about what I was doing to my wife and my kids. And I knew I was crucifying them. And I knew that I was going to have to do it again because I couldn't help it. And I'd get to hurting so bad in here I'd have to go out and get a quantity of liquor and get drunk all over to get rid of the hurt. It's a vicious circle. During all that last ten years, my bed was only that far from hers. And it might as well have been in Siberia. Many's the time when I was physically dry. I've gone to bed. And I've lain there until I could tell by her breathing that she was asleep. And then I'd cry me up a river. It's all I could do. Cry me up a river. I wanted to take her in my arms and say, Look, honey, I love you. I'll never do this again. But I couldn't. Because I'd already done it a hundred times. So, I never got to the point that I didn't love my wife and my kids. And I loved them that morning when I came to. And I must spend such time as I had. Rubbing out the record. <clears throat> I accepted death that morning. And it was all right with me. Because, you see, the next to the last time out, I'd almost made it. <clears throat> In my withdrawal period, I'd gone to the kitchen after a glass of buttermilk. Mrs. C. and Richard were sitting in the living room. And they heard me let out a beller and heard me hit the floor. And they figured that I was in an alcoholic convulsion, which was my want. 
So they came running out to see if they could keep me from swallowing my tongue. But I wasn't convulsing. I'd already used up all my convulsions. And I was just lying there on the kitchen floor as peaceful as anybody you ever saw. I wasn't doing nothing. <laughs> They'd tell me I was a peculiar color. <laughs> I was blue. <laughs> and they couldn't wake me up. And they got all exercised and called the oxygen squad from the Beverly Hills of Stephen Hospital. Just come down and see if they could do anything for me. <clears throat> now, as serious as this is, it just tickled the hell out of me. Because that woman and those kids had been praying me for, praying for me to die for at least five years. And they came out in the kitchen and found me dead. And quick, they call the oxygen squad. <laughs> now, this isn't a figment of my imagination. And many of you women have heard my lady, who is an ala nani nani in a hot cha cha. <laughs> she talks to a lot of people. And she'll get up here standing right up here, just as big as life and twice as natural. And she will say, I found myself on many occasions trying to devise ways and means to get rid of this monkey for forever and not get caught. <laughs> now, I don't think that's nice. <laughs> so it sort of tickles me that... They called the oxygen squad. And I have reason to believe they brought me around. <laughs> now, when I came to, I remember what happened from then on. There's a young doctor with these guys. And he said to me, said he, to all intents and purposes, you were dead. He says, we've had a hell of a time bringing you to. Nobody will ever bring you to again under these circumstances. And then he gave me the finest piece of counsel I'll ever hear in my entire lifetime. He looked me right in the eye and he said, if I were you, I wouldn't do that anymore. <laughs> <laughs> and now I want to pass that on. If I were you, I wouldn't do that anymore. <clears throat> but I did it again. <laughs> and the last time was worse than the next to the last time, so I accepted that. And it was all right. But I didn't want to die with a record. So, in the midst of my despair, I remembered that Mr. C. had found Jack Alexander's article in the Post. In March 1941, just five years before, she had read it and decided that it would be good for me and had put it on the left arm of the chair I sit in right now, open at the right page. Now, when I came in, I saw it and I read it. And that morning, I remembered that. And I only remembered two things about it. Because I was four sheets in the wind when I read it. Just remember two things, that drunks help drunks and didn't drink. And they called it Alcoholics Anonymous. And I said to myself, if I ever live to get out of this bed, I'll find AA. And instantly, the curtain dropped. My little period of sanity was over. I was sickened to death, drunk, and insane. And I had a lot of dying to do. But from the very second of commitment until right now, I have never had a drink or a sedating or tranquilizing pill of any kind. Such is the great significance of this thing called surrender. Surrender. Surrender is victory for the alcoholic. 
And that's the reason we have so much trouble with it. Because we are not born to surrender. We are alcoholics. We are born to win. And we almost did. I call us the almost people. Almost was I president of the United States. But I got just a little bit alcoholic. <laughs> and that's all, brother. We are not people who run around surrendering on every other street corner. If there was ever a bunch of people on earth that have little or no respect for authority, it's us. They tell us, do thus and so, and we say, who said so? And they whip out the book, and they read it to us, you know. And when they get through reading, we say, who wrote it? <laughs> so this is the, the big problem. Because we can't surrender. Had it been necessary for me to consciously surrender the first time, I would have died without coming to this program. I never admitted defeat one time in 43 years of life until I came to in January 1946. It's the first time I'd ever admitted defeat. So, I can say to you without fear of successful contradiction that the greatest single event that has ever happened to me in 75 years of life You are the most insensitive orga, uh, audience I've ever talked with. You know damn well I don't look like I was 75 years old. <laughs> now I'm going to say that again, and when I say it, I want every one of you to say, No. The greatest single event that ever happened to me in 75 years of life. Oh. Oh, that's bad. <laughs> was when the bottle killed me. In January 1946. The greatest single event that's ever happened to me in my life. Now... Before I forget this, too, I think this is a, a, quite a, a thing to be able to say. My 75th year of life and my 32nd year of sobriety without a drink or pill coincided. And it was by far the best year that I have ever lived, including my early childhood. I've never had a year like it in my entire lifetime. And it's all because of people like you, a program like Alcoholics Anonymous, and a God of my very own. It's fantastic. Now I got here surrendered. Totally surrendered. Not by a conscious surrender, but by the bottle. The bottle killed me. I went through the gates of insanity and death. And I didn't want anything for myself at all, not even sobriety. I just wanted to gain enough time to rub out as much as I could of the record before it kicked off. Now... When it came time for me to look for you people, I didn't know where to find you. My keen alcoholic mind told me you would not be in the phone book. You were anonymous, weren't you? <laughs> they don't anonymous in the phone book. And so knowing that you weren't there, I never looked. <laughs> And that's the story of my life. 
I knew so much that wasn't true. I couldn't learn anything that was. So I had to call people and ask them if they knew anybody that knew anybody in Alcoholics Anonymous. And I finally got a guy's name. Telephone number from a doctor in Beverly Hills. He was a picture man. And I called him up. Talked with him a little while and he says, uh, to me, have you had a drink today? And I said, no. Well, he says, don't take one. He says, I'm working nights and I can't take you to a meeting tonight, but call me tomorrow. Maybe I won't be working tomorrow night. And I'll take you to a meeting. So I called him tomorrow. We talked a little bit and he says, have you had a drink today? And I says, no. Well, he says, don't take one. I'm still working. <laughs> call me tomorrow. So I called him again the next day. And... We started out much the same way, and I says, I know you're still working. And he says, yeah. I says, you don't have to take me to a meeting. Tell me where there's a meeting that I can go to, and I'll go on my own power. You don't have to take me. And he told me. And it was a, a Sunday. And this meeting was Sunday. And it was in the Veterans of Foreign Wars Hall at Wilshire in Santa Monica in Beverly Hills. And so I decided that I was going. Now, this sort of tickles me, too. Because, you see, when it came about time to go, I got to worrying about being seen with people like you. <laughs> it just might not be... <laughs> be good for my reputation. <laughs> now, you don't know how funny that is. Because in my last ten years, I spent more time in the Beverly Hills jail than the jailer. <laughs> I got to think that it might be bad for my reputation. So I disguised myself a little. And I went to the first meeting. And I'll never forget it if I live to be a thousand. It was on the ground floor. I had two good garments left, and I'd put them on. I had a gray camel's hair top coat with a big collar and a belt around the middle. And I put that on and tied it up good and pulled that collar up around my head. And I had a hat with a brim about that wide. Many of you have seen it. <laughs> and I put that on and pulled it down over my face and sallied forth. <laughs> I got to meeting and I was on the ground floor and I stood in the door and looked at about 40 people, I suspect. And they were all standing in the middle of the room. Every one of them talking and nobody listening. And you didn't look like me, and you weren't dressed like me, and you weren't talking like me, because it was all happy talk. So again, my keen alcoholic mind told me that this was the wrong night. These were the veterans and their wives, and they were there for a party. And I was going to have to leave and come back the night the drunks were there. And I turned to go. And here is Alcoholics Anonymous. In a capsule. This is it. Somebody in the middle of that room had been watching me. And when I turned to leave, he came running over to the door. And he yelled at me, he says, Mister, were you looking for somebody? And I said, No, sir. Well, he says, What were you looking for then? And thinking he was a veteran, I said to him, If it would interest you, sir, I was looking for sobriety. And everything about that man changed that quick. He lit up like a Christmas tree. His whole being changed just that quick. And it was obvious to me that he was glad I was there. Now, you alcoholics know what I'm talking about. My own flesh and blood wouldn't even spit on me. And here's a man I'd never seen that was so glad I was there that he lit up. 
and I was no bargain. I'd just come off a of four weeks blackout. But to him, I was a bargain. And I was hooked before he ever opened his mouth again. And when he did, this is what he said. Why, take off your hat and coat. You're in the right place. And he took me and rocked me to sleep. This is Alcoholics Anonymous. Without this, no recoveries at all. Did it ever occur to you how fortunate we are that we love each other? How very fortunate we are that we love each other. A wet drunk is not easy to love. It just about takes one to love one, doesn't it? <laughs> and this is the greatest good fortune we have. It is my opinion that no alcoholic ever got sober on profundity or on principles. We are allowed to get sober by the spirit of Alcoholics Anonymous. We maintain sobriety by the practice of the principles. But we don't get sober on principles or profundity. It is the spirit. Alcoholics Anonymous is a fellowship of men and women who share, who share their experience, strength, and hope one with another that they might solve their common problem and help others to recover from alcoholism. Caring and sharing is Alcoholics Anonymous, and this is the thing that makes it tick when just about nothing else does. And we are so fortunate, so very fortunate that we love each other. Because that spirit of Alcoholics Anonymous is spelt L-O-V-E, love. And they say that God is love, you know. Now, without any thought of criticizing the non-alcoholic world, because I can look at my last ten years, and I can't myself understand why I performed like I performed. I can't understand it. Because, you see, I was physically as dry between every two drunks for, uh, for ten years as I am this morning. But I always had to get drunk again. So I can't understand that performance. For instance, up until my very last drunk, it was never my fault that I drank. Now, I drank for 25 years. Wouldn't you have thought that one of those drunks in 25 years would have been my fault? <laughs> By accident, if nothing else. But right up until my last drunk, it was never my fault. It was your fault. It was my wife's fault. It was her mother's fault. It was the boss's fault. Circumstances and conditions. But never mind. Until my last drunk and my last time out, I came to see that if there be fault, it is mine. And I haven't had to drink anymore. This is a fabulous thing. So I'm not criticizing the non-alcoholic world. But if they see one of us in the gutter, they give us a wide berth. Many of them perhaps think that we deserve to be there. Some of them even might think that we like it there, you know. <laughs> and all of them know that if we, if we had any backbone or any character, we wouldn't be there. But when we see one of our people in the gutter... We know that he hates that gutter worse than anybody on the face of the earth could hate that gutter. Because he knows that gutter. He's been there before. And he hates it. And he's not there because he wants to be, but because he has to be. And we know that so we can go over and pick him up. Put him on our laps and rock him to sleep. This is the thing that is so fantastic about our society. And this is the reason that we're here this morning.
to share our experience, strength, and hope one with another in love. This is the reason we're here. This is the only reason I'm up here. You know, I've been to Grants Pass before. It's a pretty nice place. But I got a nice place down there in Laguna Beach. I just might have the best view on the face of the earth. On a clear day, I can see to China. <laughs> it's very comfortable. So, why am I here? I'm here because you asked me. And I wanted to come. It's no chore for me because I love the people of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I love the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I love the life that my wife and I and our children have been able to live for the last 32 years. It's a fantastic thing. Now, <clears throat> to answer the question that I was asked, I had the experience of six months of meetings. In every meeting that I was in, I sat there knowing that I didn't have enough left to get this thing, physically or mentally. And it was all right. But you see, I didn't have any place else to go. And I liked what I saw and felt and heard in my first meeting. And so I was back every night for six months. And after six months of a meeting every night, I discovered that I was sober and had been for six months. Without a drink or a pill. Now that was the first great discovery. The second discovery was maybe six months later. When I discovered I had a family. Now, this is very interesting to me because I didn't know I had a family. I had a little old gal there in Beverly Hills that'd go with me to meetings. She was a sweet little old thing. She's probably 20, 25 years my senior. Very small, very delicate, and very wealthy. And she walked like she was walking on eggs, you know, and she dressed to the hilt and always wore hats, even to AA meetings. And uh, her name was Louise. And sometime between the first six months and the first year, she called my house thinking to get me on the phone. And she got Mrs. C. And she says, who in the hell are you? Mrs. C says, well, I'm Chuck's wife. Didn't know he had a wife. <laughs> and Mrs. C says, well, he doesn't either. <laughs> <laughs> but sometime between that first six months of the year, I discovered I had a family. And they were living like kittens. And that was a beautiful discovery. Another six months went by, and I discovered I was still trying to clean up my desk at the office. And business was good. Business was plum good. And another year went by, and I discovered that my own state of being, my life, was better than anything I'd ever dreamed of. And that wasn't a bad discovery. And now maybe... Five years, maybe six years have gone by. And I discovered that I was never alone anymore. Never alone anymore. I had a God of my very own, and wherever I am, he is. Now, when we make this discovery, the search is over, and life begins. It's fantastic. It's a fantastic. It's fantastic. 
It's a fantastic thing. Probably the most fortunate thing about our society is that the formula for sobriety and the formula for the good life and the formula for self-discovery is the same formula. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. The twelve steps of Alcoholics Anonymous. And all we need to do is to do them as honestly as we can for one reason and one reason only, and that is sobriety. I think our biggest problem is that we get conditions on our sobriety. Like getting our wives back, or our husbands back, or the love of our kids back, or our health back, or our jobs back. We have conditions on sobriety. Now, fortunately for me, I had no conditions on sobriety. I had as nice a little group of related disorders as you can get in one assortment. I told you about it. She was divorcing me. The kids wouldn't come home when I was around. My boss was going to throw me through the window if I ever stepped foot in the plant again. I had no home, no job, no health, no sanity, and no money. Now, I don't think you can come up with any better related disorders than those. (laughs) You want to know something? I never spent five seconds on any one of those related disorders. Not five seconds. I had accepted the fact that everything dear to me in life was gone and should be gone. And I wasn't entitled to have it back. So I did these things that you told me about the first night for sobriety and sobriety only. And these are the discoveries as I went along. And I can pinpoint them in time. But out here 32 years, looking back, it all happened the morning I woke up. Came to, rather. And saw myself and accepted myself and the conditions around me as they were. Threw in the towel. Decided that if I ever was lived to get out of the bed, I'd find Alcoholics Anonymous. That is when it all happened. And I want to spend the rest of my time talking about that. I do not believe that There is enough intellectual knowledge on the face of the earth to get one alcoholic sober and keep him sober. I don't believe there's enough on the face of the earth. I don't believe any alcoholic can obtain and maintain sobriety on his own. I think something has to happen to the insides of an alcoholic. For instance, why am I not drunk this morning? There's no nicer morning than this to be drunk. (laughs) There ain't no better day than Sunday to be drunk when it's Sunday. Now, if it was Monday, that would be the best day. (laughs) But when it's Sunday, this is the best day. Why am I not drunk? I'm a tongue-chewing, babbling idiot. Drunk. And of myself, I can't any more keep from drinking than I could 35 years ago. And I cannot drink and live. So why am I not drunk right now? There's only one reason. Just one, not two. I have the thing I was looking for in the bottle. I have the thing I was looking for in the bottle. What is the thing? It's the ability to live comfortably, peacefully, and joyously with me. That's sobriety. Now, when I got here, most of us thought that if we hadn't had a drink today, we were sober. We spent a lot of time on that. We said much to each other. Uh, Put the plug in the jug. Put the plug in the jug. You know. Well, I never had any problem putting a plug in the jug. I was a periodic for ten years. And after every drunk, I put the plug in the jug. Tight. 
forever. But that was no problem at all. My problem that when the time come, I took the plug out of the jug. <laughs> For ten years, I put the plug out of the jug. So, I think 97% of us now believe that sobriety is built on not drinking today. But that's only the foundation. That is only the foundation. Sobriety is physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual. And it adds up to the ability to live comfortably, peacefully, and joyously with ourselves. And the wonder of wonders is when I can live comfortably, peacefully, and joyously with me. I haven't the slightest difficulty living with you. Isn't that strange? The most freeing thing that I can say to, to, to you this morning is this. You don't have to change anything for me to love you. Nothing. If you're drunk, you don't even have to get sober. If you're a thief, you don't have to quit thiefing. If you're a liar, you don't have to quit lying. I love you. And what a freedom this is. Because, you see, I know who you are, whether you do or not. I know who you are, whether you do or not. And for that reason, I love you. And you don't have to change anything about yourself for me to love you. Now, this coming from a man who spent 40 years of life trying to make the world over so it'd be a fit place for me to live in. <laughs> and I got news for you, it ain't ready. It ain't ready. This is a great freedom. Now, Something has to happen. And it does, if we take these first nine steps honestly. The first nine steps taken by me, for me, for sobriety, are the surrender steps. They are the surrender steps. They squeeze us right out of ourselves. The first nine steps. That's the purpose of it. It's just like you put your head in a vice at step number one and somebody takes a crank on it. Step number two, another crank. Step number three, two cranks. <laughs> step number four, a crank. Step number five, four cranks. <laughs> Six and seven. And eight and nine. Now those nine steps will surrender anybody that will honestly take them. And in surrender, we are removing the only roadblock between me and you and me and God. I am convinced after living for 32 years with people like you that the first two words of the Lord's Prayer mean exactly what they say. Our Father. You remember when they asked the carpenter man, Master, teach us to pray. He said, after this manner pray ye, our Father. He didn't say my Father. He said, our Father. His father, your father, and mine. And I believe this from the top of my longest hair to my toenails. After having walked with you for 32 years. That's the way it is. And if that be true, and I'm totally convinced that it is, you can let your imagination go absolutely crazy. And you can't get close to the truth of being itself. You can't even get close to it. Imagine God, my father, I, his kid. 
What a deal. What a deal. And Alcoholics Anonymous is the thing that allows us to uncover and discover the thing we've been looking for all our lives. And it is an inside job. Every bit of it is an inside job. We uncover and discover. I am totally convinced that nobody in this room needs anything added to their lives this morning. Nothing. There's nothing to add. Every one of you is a total and complete going concern within yourself. Not because you're so hot, because you ain't. But because of the implication in the first two words of the Lord's Prayer. Our Father God. Fantastic. Now the carpenter man said this. He says, who by taking thought can add one cubit to his stature? Which means to me that you cannot change the reality of your own being. You can only change your experience in reality. For instance, I sit in the same chair today that I sat in for 10 years in hell and 32 years in heaven. The same chair. Now that little statement is a sermon as long as from here to Mars and back. And it proclaims that heaven was always in that chair. I was in hell. Now hell is very real as an experience. But it is not reality. It is not reality. And we can't change the reality of our own being. We can't be good enough to earn it or bad enough to destroy it. That's what the carpenter man said. Who by taking thought can add one cubit to his statue? And further, there don't need to be anything added. Because it says there, if God be for us, who can be against us? You see? Nobody. Because there ain't nothing to be against us if God's for us. Now, I am convinced by my own experience, definitely by my own experience, and it's been... Uh, reinforced by my reading over the years that the gift of God was made at the foundations of the earth. I do not believe that God has anything to give me today. Nothing. Not because he hasn't got anything, but because he already did. He gave us the world, the universe, and he gave us himself at the foundations of the earth. And that's the way it has always been. And he has always known it. He has never been confused. <laughs> He's always known that. But you and I have to discover it for ourselves. We have to uncover and discover the thing we've been looking for all our lives. And it is an inside job. It is an inside job. The words as we understood him in our book has nothing to do with understanding the infinite. Thank God. If understanding the infinite had been a condition for sobriety, I would have died 32 years ago. Because on that day, it was a major operation for me to tie my own shoes. I had to give it every ounce of every resource I had to dress myself or walk to the door. I didn't have anything left. So, we are not talking about understanding the infinite. We are talking about the necessity of an individual experience. You have to find your God. And I have to find my God. 
and you can't find mine and I can't find yours. Because my God is uniquely me and your God is uniquely you. Because you see, God is life. God is life and we're alive. It's fantastic. Now, has anybody else ever believed this but me? Am I the only one that's ever believed this way? I don't think so. Because that same carpenter man said, I and my father are one. Not two, one. He said, I am in the father and he in me and I in you. That's pretty close, isn't it? That's pretty close. And he further said, the kingdom of heaven is within you. And he further said, it's not I, but the Father in me, he doeth the works. Now this is pretty close business. Who else thought that way? Brother Lawrence thought that way. Brother Lawrence was a pot and pan washer in a in a monastery right out of Paris. He was Carmelite brother. Back in 1666, he and I were boys together. We, we, we knew each other well. And Brother Lawrence would be back there in the corner of the monastery washing pots and pans. And he said everybody would be yelling for something different at the same time. And he didn't pay any attention to him. He just went ahead talking to God. So he didn't know when his prayers of office started and stopped, and his prayers began, because he talked to God all the time. Now he became quite a counselor, and he did a lot of good. And he was talking to one of his troubled friends one day, and he said to him, He is within you. Look not for him elsewhere. Now that, that sounds like it's somebody else believed the same way. What about Meister Eckhart? He's the guy that said, you have heard that nature abhors a vacuum. I tell you that God abhors a vacuum, can't abide a vacuum any place under heaven, however small. Now, says he, all you got to do is to get empty of self. Surrender. And automatically, you're full of God. Now, that comes nearer explaining what happened to me in January 1946 than anything I've ever heard or read, any place. Get empty of self. Get rid of duality, which is the human ego. And automatically, you're full of God. It's fantastic. Now, who else believed that? And this I, I just tickles me pink, really. This is a saint now that I'm going to speak of next. And I don't happen to be a Catholic, so don't think I came up with <laughs> any Catholicism on you. I don't they wouldn't want they wouldn't have me if I wanted to be a Catholic. <laughs> but anyhow, I don't happen to be. And incidentally don't aspire to be. I love them, but uh, I love you better, and this program of ours better. So, this guy, his name is St. Augustine. The Irish amongst you will call him St. Augustine. I like Augustine better. It flows a little bit better. And he flowed, that guy. He was quite a rounder. I don't know how much you know about him, but he, he was he was naughty. <laughs> he drank a lot of flit. <laughs> and he had a strong weakness for women. A very strong weakness for women. I've noticed that in several uh, alcoholics. 
And so he didn't get around to coming home until he was about as old as I was. His mother had been praying for him for 40 years, and he'd say, honey, don't quit. Say, Keep it up. Maybe sometime it'll take. And it did, eventually. And St. Augustine came home. And a little later on, he was talking to God about this deal. And this is what he says, and it just curls my hair. It just curls my hair. It's so much like me. He said to God, Too late have I loved thee, O thou beauty of ancient days, yet ever new. Too late have I loved thee, and behold, thou wert within, and I abroad, and there I searched for thee, deformed I, plunging amidst the fair forms which thou hast made. Thou wert with me, but I was not with thee. <laughs> oh, that tickled me. You know, in my last years, there was no way that I could get out of the garage of my car at night. We already had a boy that was bigger than I was. <laughs> and it's just be taking your life in your hands to try to get that car out of the garage. <laughs> and so I didn't try. But when I ran out of whiskey after hours, something had to happen. So I'd take one of the boys' bikes. <laughs> and I'd ride all over Beverly Hills. <laughs> Trying to talk somebody out of a, a, a jug after hours, you know. Sometimes I made it. But I can sit there in that big wind of mine now and look out of that window and see me on that bike riding around Beverly Hills, ducking the cops. Trying to find a job. And I can see God riding right along with him. Right along with me, you know. And he's saying to himself, look at this silly son of a gun. Hunting all over Beverly Hills for me and I'm with him all the time. (laughs) (laughs) So, in my opinion, You and I belong to a society the likes of which there is none other in the world, I guess. We are the most fortunate segment of God's creation. We drunks. Because we have a terminal illness. Now, did you ever think you'd hear anybody get up here? And tell you that you're the most fortunate person in the world because you have a terminal illness? Well, you are. And because our illness is progressive. And because the time comes when we can no longer survive without an answer. And we stumble into Alcoholics Anonymous, willing to settle for anything at all that will allow us to live without drinking. You know? And we find out, we discover that the formula for sobriety, the formula for the good life, and the formula for self-discovery is the same formula. It's fantastic. And it ain't no big deal. It ain't no big deal. If you had to earn it, it would be pretty tough. But if we had to earn it, we wouldn't have Alcoholics Anonymous. Bill Wilson didn't have time to earn anything. Why, well, no, Joe told us a little last night about that. You know, when Abby talked to Bill, Bill listened until he got to the point where he was talking about finding a power greater than, greater than himself. You know, Bill just quietly turned off his urinate because he thought he was an agnostic. 
And he went ahead drinking gin. Well, that ain't bad. Uh, if you drink enough of it, <laughs> it'll get the job done right there. Well, Bill kept drinking. And he got back in town hospital. And he was, this was a baddie, the worst he'd had. And he lying there in his withdrawal, agony. He hears Dr. Silkworth tell Lois, Bill's wife, to be as nice to him as she could. Because within six months, she was either going to have to bury him or lock him up forever. He'd be a raving maniac. Now, that isn't good information when you're feeling good. <laughs> and when, it, when, when you've got a bad, bad hangover, it's bad information. And Bill got to thinking. And he said to himself, I've done everything anybody ever asked me to do. But one. And nothing has happened. Now he says, maybe there's something in what Abby was talking about. Maybe there's something in this God stuff. And he yells out, God, if there be a God, reveal yourself to me now. And it happened like that. And we got Alcoholics Anonymous. He had no time to earn anything. He fulfilled the conditions, and there it was. I had no time to earn anything. Had I had to earn anything at all, I'd have died 32 years ago. But I fulfilled the conditions, and there it was. So, we can't be good enough to earn it, and we can't be bad enough to lose it. This is our great good fortune. Now, there's another little thing that I'll spend a minute on, and I'll quit. <clears throat> The carpenter man said, pray without ceasing. Pray without ceasing. Now, I've long since come to believe that any serious thought is a prayer. Long since I've come to see that any serious thought is a prayer. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. So, I saw the sort of life to continue in the conscious awareness of the living presence of the Almighty. Throughout the day, I've changed everything that I didn't like about the society. I've changed everything that I didn't like about the prayers. I changed the 11th step of our program. All these things I change for me because they feel better the way I do them. <laughs> for instance, I knew when I was a kid that high, my insides blasted to me that there was a line in the Lord's Prayer that didn't belong there. I always knew that. And uh, it always bothered me. And the line is, lead us not into temptation. But now my insides told me when I was dehyde or duck that my God could not lead me into temptation. Now I was sober quite a while before I turned over to St. James and I found that right there on the first page it says if you were tempted, if you are tempted, don't say I'm tempted by God. God cannot be tempted by evil, neither can he tempt any man. If you are tempted, it is because of your own desires. Ah, I can go right down the road with that. But I can't go afoot with a God that would tempt me to see if I loved him. So, I changed that. And I'll swear I found uh, that in the direct translation of Aramaic into English, it says the same thing that I changed it to. <laughs> that line is changed this way from the, in the direct translation. 
It says, Thou leadest us not into temptation, but delivereth us from evil. Now, I like that good. So, that was an improvement for me. I just like it better. Maybe you don't. But I do. I also changed St. Francis's prayer. There was a line in there that I didn't like too good. It says, uh, for it's better to love than to be loved. It's better to understand than to be understood. For it is in giving that we receive, in forgiving that we're forgiven, and in dying to self that we awaken to eternal life. Now, it doesn't say dying to self. It says dying. And I said to me, I don't want to wait till I die to find eternal life. He didn't mean dying. He meant dying to self or surrender. And I said to myself, well, wait a minute now. You're talking to a lot of people and a lot of Catholics in the audience, and maybe this isn't uh, acceptable to them. So I called up Manresa. Now, Manresa is the Jebby retreat house down in our country. And uh, I know the Padres over there pretty good. So I took uh, took one of our... Jesuits that I met right here in Grants Pass last time up here and introduced him to the gang at Manresa and he's been giving drunk retreats down there for us for years now doing a fine job so I called up the Jebby retreat house and I got Father Toner on the line and I says Father look what I did to St. Francis prayer for it is in dying to self that we awaken to eternal life. And he says, what the hell do you think he meant? <laughs> Just like he had known it all his life. And I swear he'd never even thought of it until I told him. <laughs> but I like it that way because that's the way it happened to me. Does this answer you? Hmm? So... I was sitting down there in my big chair probably 17 years ago and there's a column here in the corner of the room and a great big window here and a big window here and my chair sits back here. And I was just sitting there, it was on a Saturday or Sunday because I was still working at the time. And out came a great number of snowbirds. Now, snowbirds, for you landlubbers, are small sailboats of a certain size. And they were in a race. There might have been a hundred of them. And uh, I was just sitting there idly watching them. And it occurred to me that every one of them was going a little bit different direction. And there was only one wind. And this got to me. And then I, out of the storehouse, came these words that I'd known ever since I was a kid. Some ships ply east, and some ply west, by the selfsame wind that blows. Tis the set of the sail, and not the gale, that determines where it goes. And ever since then, I've had a little habit daily of reminding myself maybe 50, 100, 150 times a day of the living presence of my very own God. The conscious awareness of the living presence of God. I'd say to myself maybe 50 times, God is my refuge and my strength. But you might say, why would you do it 50 times? Just to trim the sails. Fear not, little flock. It's the Father's good pleasure to give us the kingdom. You say that 50 times. Or lift up thine eyes into the hills from whence cometh thy strength. You know. 
Or take no thought of the morrow, what you shall eat, what you shall drink, or wherewithal you shall be clothed. The heavenly Father knoweth what you have need of before you ask him. And this is just a matter of trimming the sails. Constantly reminding me that in him I live and move and have my being now. And it's, it's very precious to me. It's, it's just a good state of being, you know. And I highly recommend it. Pray without ceasing. And it's not a big deal. It's not a big deal. I actually have more fun with God than I do with people. Really, I do. I'm not afraid of him, and I don't think he's afraid of me. (laughs) (laughs) And I share everything in life with him. The good, the bad, and the indifferent. If I do a lousy stunt, I look at it and I share it. I say, look, Father, look what I did yesterday. Now, isn't this a hell of a thing for a guy like me to do? I knew better when I did it, but I had to make an impression. (laughs) Or she was awful pretty. You know. Now, I don't like it, and you don't like it. And I'm going to do better, and with your help, I'll do a lot better. Sure, thank you. And I dump it, and I never pick it up again. It's gone. And I do the same thing with the good thing. I think it's just as tough on us to try to harbor or hang on to the so-called good as the so-called bad. And so I share it. I say, look, Father. Isn't this terrific? It couldn't happen to a bum like me, but it did. And I know where it came from. Sure, thank you. And I dump it, and I never pick it up again. And it keeps the the road clear. You know, it allows me to move spontaneously. And that's what life is all about. And in closing, I hear so much amongst us about our inability to face reality. Our inability to face reality. You just hear that every place, you know. And particularly amongst the learned. We can't face reality. But now, my opinion up until I came to you, my opinion of reality was a banker who would loan you an umbrella when the sun was shining and take it away from you when it rained. (laughs) That's reality. Grim reality. You know? And hell, I didn't like it. But I like it now, because reality, reality to me now, is the shimmer of the moonlight on the Rogue River. That's reality. Reality to me is the whisper of the breeze as it goes through these big pine trees up here. That's reality. Reality to me is a baby's spontaneous laugh. That's reality. Reality is to be able to laugh when we feel like it. It's to be able to tell each other that we love each other. And it's it's to be able to tell God, I love you too. God bless you. Thank you very much. (laughs) 
Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.